again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Odyssey House Journals, one of the most watched podcasts dealing with addiction and recovery. I'm Randall Carlisle, my co-host, Rachel Santizo. You're looking wonderful today. Thank you. What's the t-shirt? Well, you can't really see it, but it says be kind. So it has like hearts and rainbows to like, just to bring out like be a good human being that makes you feel better and it makes the world a better place. Just, just think if everyone around the world adopted that for a day or two, how wonderful the world would be. Absolutely. So good, luck on, good, good luck on that one, Rachel. That's why I'm wearing this shirt. I'm trying to like hypnotize. <laughs> Hey, I, I just saw, I, we try to impart, other than opinion, I impart a few facts. And this is a recurring theme that I keep coming across. And, and I guess it's a concern. It's a concern here at Odyssey House because we've noticed more of this happening. The American Psychological Association conducted a survey in February and almost one quarter of adults reported drinking more to manage pandemic stress. Uh, and and one of the people who conducted the research says, you know, and there's, it's one thing to, to drink to relax when you come home, although I shouldn't say that because I, I, I'm a recovering alcoholic, but, but previous research suggests people who drink in order to cope instead of just for pleasure are at increased risk of developing an alcohol use disorder. Yeah, I mean, that makes complete sense, right? It's using a substance as a coping mechanism. Right. What I'm curious about, because we've discussed this before and we said isolation, not having to have other people smell if you've been drinking, like all of these reasons why. What I'm interested in is as we're getting back into in-person um, visits, work, everything, if this is gonna decrease or not, that's what I'm wondering. Well, I hope it does because what we've noticed here at Odyssey is that whereas the, most people were coming in for meth or heroin or something like that, during the pandemic, we've had a massive increase of people coming in uh, wanting to deal with an alcohol problem. So right. yeah, it will be interesting when we all get back in person, if people will be drinking less, <laughs> I guess I we'll, not, let, let me ask you, because you've dealt with the uh, criminal justice system back in your heyday of being homeless and, and, and on drugs. Uh, what, when, when I say probation officer, what do you picture? So if I'm speaking in terms of before, yes. so, um, I pitch, I, what I would picture is just someone like above me looking down on me, like a scary figure, right? That I had to answer to and that I was always afraid to answer to. And so it's definitely like a looking up at a figure like super scared. Yeah, and I, and I think that's probably a fair assessment from, from the people that we work with here in Odyssey House. Today, I am going to introduce you to someone who breaks that stereotype, okay? His name is Greg Peterson. Greg, check on, come on down. There he is. Oh, he doesn't I, look so scary. <laughs> he doesn't look scary, does he? No. <laughs> well, uh, maybe you would have wanted him as your probation officer back when you were dealing with the criminal justice system. Uh, Greg is the head probation officer for a program. And, and I had to look it up, Greg, because we refer to you act. We just say you act, you act. And, and I looked it up and it says, if I'm correct, Utah Alternatives to Conviction Track. Yeah, that's correct. What, you know, what does that mean? So thanks for having me on. It's good to be with you. And I uh, need to get me that be kind shirt because when people think of probation officers, Rachel, I think they think of like kindness, right? Right, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so, sure. So you act is a program which we started here in the federal district court in Utah about four and a half years ago. We started in January of 2017. There's two different tracks in you act, track one and track two. Track one is for um, defendants who've been charged in federal court with some type of crime. Um, we've had, you know, drug cases and gun cases, and we've had um, sex offenses, just a very, you know, very range of different crimes. Um, and those who are on track one, um, we are looking for people that have like lesser criminal histories, maybe some type of aberrant conduct, you know, like I use this as an example. We've got a gal who's, she's 34 years old. She's in our program. She was a registered nurse. 
ended up um, hooking up with a guy who was toxic and she did um, meth for you know, a year and a half with him and ended up getting involved in this conspiracy case, right? But you can look at her history and you can say, she's a mom, she's been involved um, as a caretaker, you know, she, she's done schooling and all those kinds of things. Is this some type of person that we want to send to federal prison? And the answer for most of us, a lot of us is no, right? Um, she's got a skill set um, and with the right treatment, the right support, the right structure, um, we can probably do a lot of good for her. And so far, so good. Um, so with her, once, her, once she finishes our program and our program is a year to two years, um, her case will be dismissed and she will ha no longer have a federal conviction, which is huge, right? So that's a track one. So those are people that we're looking for that have kind of a lesser criminal history, um, some type of aberrant conduct. And then we have track two participants who have more of a severe criminal history, more serious criminal history, may, um, may have been more involved in their offense as far as, you know, um, not a low level conspiracy, but maybe more kind of a middle range person or, or, or a higher end person, more kind of criminal in nature, if that makes sense. And they, these people um, are in our program for up to two years as well. And we can talk about one that uh, asked Sarah by name, if that's okay, Randall, they just graduated sure. from the program last week. Rand, um, Randall came and watched one of our graduations, Beverly Martinez. You know, Beverly was part of a, of a biker gang. And we, we love Beverly, by the way. We love Beverly, yeah. Yes. And so someone like that who, you know, it took her till she was about 47, 48 to finally get it. And we had a forum to help her succeed. And as Randall can attest being at her graduation, she touched the lives of more of us as professional staff than we could have ever done for her. We just provided the platform and the support, the structure and the resources. And she was the one that was ready to fly from the nest and she soared like a beautiful eagle. It was amazing. So for example, for her, she'll, she'll get, um, she'll get, she got sentenced to five years of probation, right? So she'll keep the conviction, but she avoided prison. And as Randall can attest, she was looking at a 10 year minimum mandatory um, with her charge. So for someone like that, um, that we can course correct, um, that's what we do. And I know I'm rambling here, but the, the important thing I think to note is these are very limited coveted spots. Um, our court is, is capped at 15. Very rarely have we had that many people in our program. We've had up to 13, up to 14, um, but we're very selective. We, we want people who have kind of hit the ground running and are, and are ready to transform and change their lives. And, and what amazed me, well, first of all, it makes sense, I guess, for society, for people watching who don't understand the whole system and everything with somebody like Beverly, and I'm sure she doesn't mind that we use her name or talk about her because she's a good friend for, of all of us and she's pretty open about everything. She's very open. Um, it makes so much more sense to, she's, she's already a productive member of society now. Uh, she's, she's contributing so much. She's working for Odyssey House, by the way. But, um, you know, as opposed to sending her to federal prison for how many years she would have served, uh, this program makes a lot of sense. But as you, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's a coveted spot for this program. But what struck me about the program was both you and the judge know so because it's so small uh, you know so much about you're in each person's life and you're really following their life with everything they do whether they have a new boyfriend girlfriend whether they're looking for work what you know that kind of stuff it's it's very specific oriented yeah, we're really trying to change the way that we're perceived um, in the community is that we're, we're there to help them change their lives. We're not there to, to punish them and um, send them back to prison. And I know a lot of times when, when people get out of prison or, you know, have that kind of mindset, they're thinking they're just waiting for me to screw up so they can send me back. And my common line to people is I say, if I want to see you in prison, if I want to see people in prison, I go work at the prison, right? I go be a correction officer. My job is to keep you out in the community or help, help you stay out in the community. I can't keep you out. You've got to make those choices. But I'm going to try to do everything that I can within the authority that I have to make sure, you know, the resources and the barriers that are naturally um, put up, put in place when you get out of prison, that we can try to knock some of those down to get you um, staying on that right path. So what would it consist of, the track one and track two? So what would the, 
the daily or monthly agenda consist of as you guys yeah. walk beside these people? Yeah, good question. So um, they, they participate in the exact same program. So we have court every single Monday. Obviously, during the pandemic, we've been doing it over Zoom just because of the social distancing stuff. We're hoping to get together in the, you know, in the next couple months. <laughs> um, but we have court every um, Monday and courts from one to two. And it, when we say court, um, it's, I heard it said by someone, it was more like of a home ec class. We teach them life skills. We teach them, um, I'm a certified financial coach. So I, I'm big on like teaching them how to like manage money because money is a huge trigger. And most people that battle addiction don't know how to manage money. A lot of people in life, honestly, being a financial coach don't know how to manage money, but especially people <laughs> battling addiction. So we teach them finances, we teach them how to eat healthy, we teach them how to respect their bodies, um, how to set boundaries, improve their relationships. You know, we're looking at, it's it's like, it's a classroom setting. Um, oftentimes we we don't even do it in the courtroom. There's a big multi-purpose room in the, in the courthouse, which we use. The judge doesn't take the bench with a robe um, unless it's a formal hearing. Um, you know, we have different speakers, panelists that come in. Um, and so that's kind of what court quote unquote looks like each week. And it's, it's quite amazing. Um, I've got several in our program who are just like dying to get back into person. Like they miss that camaraderie. They miss like rubbing shoulders with the judges and the prosecutor and the probation officer, um, which you would think people would never want to be in court. Right. But I've got a gal who's, she's actually an Odyssey client who's going to graduate in July. And she's asked if she can stay on as a mentor and I said, how often do you want to come to court? She's like every single week, right? And she lives, she lives up in Ogden. So we've kind of provided a great um, support system where they really feel valued and they really want to be part of it. Now you have some that are just ready to get done and they want to be done with it and move on with their lives. But you have some that really just dig in and just are like, I just want to be connected because I love the feeling that I feel. So that's core. As far as like the the day-to-day, week-to-week stuff, um, we... I have them checking in with me every Thursday and Sunday, just usually a text or a phone call. Um, but we have a thread. So I supervise all the females in the program. Right now we have, with Beverly graduating, we now have six. Um, but we have a text thread that we're all on. It's, it's Greg and his seven girls, basically. Um, and I always tell them, unless they're married, um, I said, I want to be the most important man in your life. I said, I get really jealous. I need, I, I need to be the most important person in your life because I'm, I'm trying to mentor them. And, you know, a lot of the females that, I, that we work with have been through a lot of trauma, right? And a lot of that has been, uh, unfortunately, at the hands of men. Um, and so I try to model um, what a man should treat a woman like. And so we, we developed this cro- close relationship and so you ought to read some of these text threads. It's like each night it's like, good night, love you, sleep with the angels. And it's like, love you girls and Greg, um, you know, and you would just, that's just something that I think most people <laughs> with their probation officer, it, it's just, you know, above their head, just like, I can't even believe that's the way you guys communicate with each other. So very supportive. Um, and then we have them um, as part of our program, we have them do what I call, it's kind of like an Eagle Scout project. If you've ever heard of an Eagle Scout project where we have them do about 30 to 50 hours of like this huge project. Um, And and it's usually giving back. Like Beverly, for example, using hers, like she went out and got all this food donated and raised money and then ended up going to different homeless camps around the, the valley and up in Ogden as well. And just donated, you know, you could literally see them in the snow, walking up to places, we have them take pictures of stuff so that we can, you know, kind of memorialize it and celebrate it. And you see them like knocking on these homeless tents and just these people with tears in their eyes as they hand them, you know, bags of food and humanitarian kits and stuff like that. So we teach them to to live outside themselves as well and to give back. And um, it's an emotional thing, honestly. It's an amazing thing to see people who have been so self-centered in their addiction now really get a grasp of like, Hey, things are bigger than myself and I can give back and they, they thrive in it. They love serving. And so it's, it's an honor, honestly, to be a part of this program. Do, do you genuine at your job? Do you genuinely care about these people? A hundred percent. I shouldn't say this out loud, but <laughs> I make 
much more money. I, me and my wife own a small business. I make much more money um, in my job than I do as a probation officer. I could quit my job and financially I'd be okay. Um, I do this because I have the heart of a servant. I love serving people. I love helping people. Um, and so it's just in my nature. I just love to give back. I've been given so much. And so I feel like that this is my call. And I hope that doesn't sound tacky or corny, but it, it feels like it's my call. Um, and I have an opportunity to really make a huge influence on, on people. And I, and I love doing that. Rachel, did you ever run into a probation officer like Greg? No, this entire time I'm like, where were you? <laughs> You know, like everything I said at the very beginning, I feel like I need to take back. Great. <laughs> I get to take back like a different perspective and a different, um, a different way and approach. So thank you for changing my mind. <laughs> well, and that, and that's, I appreciate you saying that because that's one of the things I'm trying to do internally is change the way we operate and do business, right? We have these two different hats. We have law enforcement component, a part of our job, and we have a social work component, part of our job. And you have certain people that are very leaning towards one direction and other people that lean towards the other direction right um and of course i'm more leaning towards the social work i think you can obviously tell by that but there are these dual functions that we have within our job you know we can't we can't ignore criminal behavior and non-compliance like there's a way to address it um but you can do it with respect and with dignity um and i think that that's you see a lot of that in the federal system to be honest with you like the, you know most people in the in the federal system they at least have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, a lot of us do. And so there's more of a kind of an educated component coming into it that there's a, there's a more efficient, educated way of attacking um, these types of problems rather than just like, oh, you violated, let's send you back to prison and then just keep people in that re revolving recycling door, you know? The, the other thing that struck me uh, is the uh, federal magistrate who, who was handling the whole uh, court hearing acted like she really cared too, and it wasn't one of these. It wasn't one of these formal things where you're out of order. Don't don't say. I mean, it was it was more of a a one on one kind of conversation she had with each of your clients. Yeah, um, and just for clarity, so we were talking kind of about two different programs. We had the drug court, which Randall sat in, and then we have the UX. So our drug court. Um, do you want me to sh share a little bit about that? Sure. Okay, so our drug court is, so the difference between UACT and drug court, there's, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of key differences too. UACT is a front end court. So we're trying to avoid and divert people out of prison, right? Where with drug court, except in very few, very few limited circumstances, it's a post-conviction violation court, meaning they've been convicted. I don't know what the numbers are. 80, 90% of them have already served a prison term. And then they're struggling after they come out and they're on supervised release. It's not called parole. We don't have parole in the federal system that got abolished in the 80s. Um, but they're out on a term of what's called supervised release, which is essentially parole or probation. And they're usually on that for three to five years, depending. And that's the time that we're supposed to help them really get back into society, re-enter back into the community and help them with whatever we can, right? To, to overcome, like if they need a job, like do we need to send them to vocational rehab? Do we need to send them to department workforce services. You know, there's a housing crisis in Utah. Like how do we find them housing? Um, Cause as, as we all know, if we don't have stable housing that's a huge trigger, right? Right. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. And so our drug court, we're dealing with a lot more of that because people have done a lot of time in prison. A lot of times, you know, federal sentences tend to be lengthy. <laughs> um, so they're coming out and it's like, okay like I just got a guy, he's not in drug court but he's a good example. Um, he, he was sentenced to 280 months on several robbery charges. Now, if you do the math, that's, um, he didn't do all of that time. He did most of it, you know, but he's been in prison since 2001. And so think about all the barriers that this gentleman's got to deal with, right? He's got like this huge long gap in his resume. Like, how do you explain that to an employer other than just saying like, I've been in federal prison this long, like, um, he's got skills. He was in, worked in the upholstery shop, so he's actually been able to find a job. Um, but think if he didn't have skills, think about how hard that would be to help him reintegrate into society. So with that said, drug court, we're focusing with more of a, um, I hate using this term, I don't know a better word to use, but kind of a more hardened population, people that have 
have been involved in the system and, and have pretty severe addiction. Um, you know, a lot of our clients are, are in residential treatment at Odyssey and, and we, ideally, I would like to actually have them, if not all, most of them start off in residential and just do that natural transition, right? Get into right. transitional housing because I think that's what provides them best, but the best opportunity for success. But they, drug court, they come to court each Tuesday. Um, Judge Romero, she's awesome. You got to interact with her, Randall. Um, knows them by name, knows their backstories, calls them by name. Um, and she's she's like kind of a motherly figure to a lot of them, right? And just- Very much. Yeah, just kind of explains like, um, if, if she needs to put her arm around them and say, hey, <laughs> um, you need a hug, and but you need to step it up. Or if she needs to- figuratively put her foot in her backside and kick them in the butt a little bit and get them in gear, she can do that as well. And, um, and they respect that. And they, they want to come to court each week, by and large, and, and make her happy. Um, and they know the way of making her, hap her happy is by doing what they're supposed to. And so we have frequent interaction with them too, to go back to your earlier que uh, question, Rachel. Like I, I have them checking in with me three days a week. They're in, um, they're in therapy with Odyssey. Um, who we love partnering with, by the way, a lot of- Thanks lot of, for the plug. <laughs> we do, like um, I work closely with Christina Zido and, and Kate Coy and her, their staffs and all the therapists that fun underneath them and just fantastic people. Cheryl Shivers, all of them, just you know, do all that they can to help um, our population and, and we work really good together. How successful, do you have any numbers on the UAC program in, in terms of recidivism or things like that? That's a good question. That's a court that we haven't studied yet. Um, you know, it, and I can't, don't quote me on this, but we were in pilot status for close to two years and we're about four and a half years into this. So we haven't had the opportunity to really um, study those numbers. I think we've had, again, a, a, and I don't know this for a fact, but I think we've had like three or four not graduate since we started the program. So a high graduation rate. Drug courts, um, a little bit different. You know, we're dealing with a much as again, using the word hardened population. Um, I just did the numbers actually. We had from, so the last five years, we've had 46 graduate and 41 get removed. Um, so if you look wow. at those, those numbers, you know, um, I used this analogy recently, like in baseball, if you were to bat 500 or 50%, you're gonna get like a $400 million contract, right? That, that's good numbers in bat. And some people, depending on your perspective, like, oh, that's not that good of numbers in drug court, you know, but to me, it's like almost 100% of those individuals would have probably gone back to prison if we didn't have drug court. Um, so that's, that's kind of where the numbers those, are. Those are amazing numbers. If you think about it, we have, I think our average completion rate for our program is 72%, some, somewhere around there. And I think the national average is like 40% in treatment programs. Uh, and, and what people don't understand is that, that drug addiction is a lifelong complicated disease and, and relapse is, is prevalent. And for people to do the hard work, Rachel runs one of our programs now, and for people to uh, do the hard work and, and make it through is, is really amazing. Uh, so your numbers are spectacular. Yeah, we're happy with them. And, and this is what's really cool is during this pandemic, um, We've done everything we can to not, because what happens in drug court is someone will relapse and generally we'll give them like a two or three day jail sanction. And that's to kind of get their attention, break the cycle, um, disrupt the behavior, but it's not too punitive where they're likely going to lose a job or lose a house, right? It's just a kind of a quick um, instant <laughs> sanction, if you will, right? Let's, let's stop the behavior. Um, and during the pandemic, very rarely, just a, just a few times have we had to do that. We've been really creative um, and we've been a lot more patient, to be honest with you, that's kind of been the result. And since, two, since we started taking, um, let's say since January, uh, I'm just trying to look at my numbers, January of 2021, we've had five graduate and one person removed. Wow. So that trajectory is a lot better than where we were at. So it, it's showing that there's other ways than to lock people up for you know, substance abuse issues. And we partnered up, like I said, with Odyssey and um, I can get in credit to Christine Payne and her staff over admissions. I can get someone into residential like the day, that day. Um, and for someone who's worked in our federal drug court for a long time, that's a miracle. 
Like we used to put people in custody for six to eight months while we were waiting for a funded um, bed because most of them can't afford it, right? And the fact that I can get someone in that day, I tell Judge Romero, who's been with our program a couple of times, like it's amazing. Like from where we are now <laughs> to where we've been, it's, it's quite awesome. Greg, I thank you for changing my mind and opinion. Well, I have a definitely a softer opinion today, but from before, not as working for Odyssey, but as a person that was in the system. Um, I have two questions. One, I'm not sure if I should give this shirt to you or Beverly. Like I, I've been having this conflict between myself. Um, oh, and a hug. I wouldn't mind a hug. But how would, my real question is, how would somebody get involved? Someone that is in the system that was just released from prison, how would they get involved in this? Um, in both of our programs you're talking about? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. I know we're running short on time and I won't ramble, but the District of Utah has a ton of different programs, which is really awesome. Um, I said this recently in, to a host, to a couple of hosts that I was on a podcast with and they, and they chuckled when I said this. Utah, when it comes to the federal court, in our programs is very progressive. We don't use that word in Utah a lot when we describe our population, right? Um, we, we've got a mental health court first in the country. We were one of the first in the country to have drug court, first in the country to have a veterans court. This is at the federal level. First in the country, and I think the only one to have a tribal reentry court dealing with those population. And then you act, which we just talked about. So depending upon what your need is, we more than likely have some type of program. Um, and for like, we don't have a specific program for like sex offenders, for example, but we do have like a unit within our office that like targets that population to help provide them the services. So the best thing to do is if there's a specific, like, you know, if it's a substance abuse issue, I'm happy to give my phone number over the air. People can call me and see if they qualify. So that's 801-879-8555. Um, and just ask me if you feel like you qualify and we'll see what we can do to, to get you help. And if not, at least point you in some type of community-based resource that we can help people. Wow, I've never heard anybody give out a phone number like that if, if you're in trouble. <laughs> but, uh, we, uh, and, and, and the other thing I, I was gonna reveal today, if you want Greg for your probation officer, there's a website called IWantGregForMyPO.com. So, uh, <laughs> Not true, not true, <laughs> but, but you, you know, you, you, uh, you paint a different picture with all the help and the caring and everything than people I think generally on the outside have of this whole, this whole thing we're dealing with. Well, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I, do, I, de I do definitely try. I try to, to paint a different image. Um, can I share one quick story? Sure. I have an Odyssey, Odyssey client um, who's in drug court and it's just, um, she's a stage four breast cancer survivor, still working through that. And um, one of the things that she was struggling with was, you know, based upon kind of being sick and limitations, she lost her, because uh, of her addiction, she lost her driver's license, which is very common. So she couldn't get around very easily. And she just was feeling sad. And this was around October, November. And I said to her, I said, you know what I do when I feel sad? I said, I like to go serve people. And I said, you and I, we're gonna go do a service project. And we're going and I said, here's what we're gonna do because she was kind of, oh, you know, her eyes kind of lit up. She's like, I love serving. I said, we're gonna go do a, I just had it in my mind what we're gonna do. I said, we're gonna go raise some money. We're gonna go shopping together and we're gonna go do some donations to Odyssey House. And so we were able to raise like 1200 bucks between the two of us, but we bought wow. a ton of different coats. We bought journals and watches and all those kinds of things that people in residential need. And just to see the like the light come on in her eyes, it was funny, We I took my wife to go shopping. It was me and her and my wife and we went shopping to Costco and some, or Sam's Club and some other places. And she kept saying, as we're pushing the cart, she's like, I cannot believe I'm shopping with my federal PO, you know, with a smile on her face. <laughs> And I, and that really touched me. I just was like, I'm glad that I can help change the perspective um, on how my profession is viewed. And I hope that more people will kind of join along the Greg train, if you will, like there's a, there's a different way uh, and people are people and we need to treat, treat people with Rachel's shirt with kindness and respect and dignity, right? And you are an, you are an amazing person. Any final thoughts, Rachel, after meeting Greg? 
I just want to be your friend. That's the whole <laughs> this whole time. Like you are incredible. And thank you for being on here and sharing and being vulnerable. Like, yeah, my only thought, well, who to give my shirt to and if you will be my friend. <laughs> I would love to be your friend. Greg, thank you for inviting me in to, to watch Drug Court and learn a little more about your program and being part of Beverly's graduation. It's a uh, it's an uplifting side of, of what sometimes is a dismal profession that we all deal, deal with. So I we appreciate you very much. And, and that, that, uh, that website that I referred people to doesn't exist. I just want to do a disclaimer there. So any final thoughts, Greg? No, I just appreciate you. I, again, I appreciate um, just kind of the education piece. Like there's, there's so much out there that people don't know about. It was fun when I called Randall and just told him, about what we're doing and asked him to come and sit in. Uh, and, you know, he jumped in within the hour and jumped into our programs. I think he was genuinely surprised about what's out there. And I think a lot of people just don't realize that stuff's out there. And so I kind of feel like on this mission to say, there's a lot of good that's, that comes out of, out of the system. Um, there's a lot of tough times, especially, you know, you can turn on the news right now and there's a lot of things going along <laughs> or going around that uh, don't, don't paint law enforcement in, in, a, in a great light and you know there there are good ones out there for sure thank you for what you do thank you for sharing what you do with us and rachel thank you for being here again and thank you for watching odyssey house journals